Zechariah 7. So Zechariah 7 is uh, part of a section of Zechariah that's the kind of the application of the book. And so it's, I'll not say the main point of the book, but it is an important point or a central point, uh, that, which is why it's kind of placed in the middle. So Zechariah 7 is uh, put there. You have the uh, he has a sermon at the beginning calling people to repentance, and then you have eight night visions that are kind of these different, uh, this gallery of different things that's going to happen with Israel in the future to tie everything together that Messiah is going to accomplish. And then you have a symbolic crowning of Joshua the high priest to represent that the Messiah is going to be the priest and king and, uh, and finish off the real temple. And then you have these two uh, practical sermons. You have Zechariah 7 and Zechariah 8, where he preaches to the people because of what's going to happen in the future. Here's the consequences that it needs to have now. Here's why you need to obey now, because you're participating in moving God's plan forward, and you're engaging in that. So it, it talks about the, the the real point of eschatology is to have consequences or implications for uh, the present. Otherwise, you know, as I said last time, otherwise you just have a chart, you know, and uh, that's kind of our uh, circle of Christianity, the kind of dispensational circle of Christianity uh, really likes the chart, and I think the charts can be helpful, and Zechariah actually pulls everything together and kind of puts them in order, so you can, you can have a chart, um, the problem with that is a lot of times people just get into things about, okay, well, let's put all these details on a chart and forget that eschatology is more about that since God has ordained these things and the, the nature of these things of the future and the hope that we have in these things of the future, that has implications for how we behave now. Now the future matters, so therefore the present matters. Uh, if the future doesn't matter, you know, who cares? Uh, and this is one of those, uh, what I call bad, you know, apologetic arguments. I think it's, I think it's a bad argument, but people uh, think it's cute and they use it on Facebook and stuff. They're like, well, you know, if Christianity isn't true and there isn't a resurrection and all this stuff and Jesus isn't real, all this, then at least I lived a good life with hope. And I'm like, no, you, you didn't live a good life with hope because hope is a confident expectation in the future. And Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, if we, what we believed about the resurrection and Christ it were not true, then we are to be pitied. We're not to be, oh, well, at least it, it tricked me into living a, a good life. Uh, you didn't live a good life because it, it, your life was, was meaningless and everything was meaningless. But the Bible doesn't make those type of statements. It talks about confident assurance uh, of those things or, or that we uh, know that we have eternal life or that these things John talks about at the end of his gospel, that these things I've written that you may know uh, that you have eternal life or that you may know the things about the Son of God that believing you may have life in his name. So those statements of the Bible are ones of actual confidence and our confidence is in uh, the future, is in eschatology. And so how this uh, sermon gets started in Zechariah 7 is some people come to Zechariah and they ask him a question about fasting. They ask him a question that, that makes sense kind of in their time that they observed a fast where they wouldn't eat and they were the point of a fast, uh, a biblical fast, is that you would refrain from even the basic necessities, food, water, you know, unless it was just you know, a long-term fast then you'd have some bread and water. But it was that something else took priority that you always prayed, and that you were showing God that you were sincere by even setting aside things that you needed in order to give more focus, uh, if not total focus, to uh, seeking God in prayer. So it could be for repentance. Uh, it could be over uh, a particular pressing situation, uh, some type of trial or something of that nature. It could be 
that mourning about the, the present you know, situation. And so what they were fasting about, they had these fasts that were in particular months, and I have to uh, ask uh, some Jewish people, I, I actually don't know, or I guess I could look it up online, but if they still observe these fasts to this day, but they had a fast for the fall of Jerusalem that happened in 586. Um, they were, you know, they would fast to mourn over that. Now this is 70 years later, in 518 or so. And uh, they're fasting over that. They're fasting over the, the siege of the city by Nebuchadnezzar. They're fasting over uh, there had been a governor that they had liked, that had been appointed over Jerusalem you know, before it had been totally destroyed and he got murdered and so they uh, they fasted over that and these were fast in uh, particular months and so they come to Zechariah and they say okay the city's being kind of rebuilt we're seeing some prosperity the temple's being rebuilt is it still necessary for us to fast in these months like we've done for these 70 years and God basically send Zechariah to turn the question around on them and enlarge it and ask you know them a larger question and say was it really for me that you were fasting all these 70 years or when you eat and drink is it really for yourself and when you fast is that's kind of for yourself as well that it's really just this observance of a, a ceremony of a ritual of a practice but not really something that you're trying to um, be sincere before God uh, anymore. It may have been for some people at the time, it may have been going back, but they were starting to engage in hypocritical fasting while they were still obeying, disobeying God's word. And that was the problem of uh, the previous generation, that that's what they said. And God said, this is a fast that God hasn't even commanded. Uh, and you're, you're observing that, you know, this man-made thing, which can be okay, but you're not even following the law. And that's the main problem. Uh, so he, he turns it around on them and asks them, let me read Zechariah 7, 5 through uh, 7, and it'll catch us up to kind of where we were. It says, uh, Say to all the peoples of the land and to the priests, when you fasted and mourned in the fifth and seventh months, these 70 years, and it's really like all these 70 years, it's supposed to be sound long, was it actually for me that you fasted? When you eat and drink, do you not eat and drink for yourselves? Are, these, uh, are not these the words which the Lord proclaimed by the former prophets when Jerusalem was inhabited and prosperous along the cities? around it and along the Negev which is the south countries and the foothills were inhabited so God was saying remember when the land was all prosperous and you know you were eating and drinking doing all these things for yourself but disobedient to the law it, they were more prosperous than you are now and they still got punished and sent out of the land so don't think that just by fasting you're going to avoid um, God's discipline if you're, if you're continuing to disobey God's law and so he's saying, you know, was it really for me? Um, I think a tie-in here is, is interesting to, uh, to think about a little bit. When it talks about maybe you recognize, we said, when you ate and drank, you eat and drink for yourselves. When you fasted, was it really for me? Uh, we have that verse in 1 Corinthians, it's a little bit of different context, right? Where whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That are we, you know, really thinking? Because if, if we really thought about every moment of the day consciously, or when we're eating or drinking, we really think about doing these things uh, to the glory of God. Um, and so that's what what God is is wanting from the people here is a real focus on Him. And so He asks them this. Then He turns it around on them and says, "Okay, here's what you should do. Here is how you should represent your relationship." to me. Here's how you should show your relationship to God and your relationship to God. One of the ways that can be shown is your relationship to others, your faithfulness to the law in relation to other people. And we were saying uh, last week, we were talking about that the, uh, 
nature of ethics or the nature of justice is always defined uh, by the nature and character of God. But I wanted to expand on this and uh, talk about it a little bit just in, in terms of the uh, worldview systems that try to operate on a system of justice or ethics and uh, what the Bible says here, what Zechariah says about what to, how to practice justice. Because a lot of times you see people, you know, posting uh, Bible verses, especially during these times where the word justice is, is a catchword for, for a lot of things and has a lot of different definitions. You want to be, uh, be clear about those things. Um, but you have a lot of people posting, you know, verses that, that have justice in them, but it's like, well, yeah, but we, we want to be careful about what that means, uh, it, that there's differences of uh, what justice is and how do we define justice? That's a, that's a huge question to ask because if it's just the individuals who define justice uh, or if it's groups that define justice or the majority that defines justice or the state defines justice, I mean, we have some you know, huge problems with that. Uh, but let me read uh, Zechariah 7, 8, and, uh, and following, 7, 8 through uh, 10, that talks about God's prescription for the people. He, he says, you know, there's only one fast that was uh, commanded in Israel. It was for the, the Day of Atonement. Uh, it doesn't actually use the word fast, but it says you're to humble your souls and to afflict your souls, and you, you fast for, you know, this, this uh, limited period about 24 hours on the Day of Atonement. And uh, this was, you know, was supposed to be accompanied by repentance. But that's the only commanded fast in, uh, in the Bible. You have other ones, morning. You have other fasts that are recognized, you know, and, and participated in, but they're for some specific purpose and they're not permanent. Um, and so God says, instead, here's what I'd like to see. Well, he doesn't, he kind of asks them a rhetorical question. Was it really for me that you fasted? Here's what you, you ought to do instead, whether you keep fasting or not. This is what will demonstrate uh, your relationship to God, whether or not you're sincerely obedient to God. Uh, starting in verse 8, Zechariah 7, 8. Then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, Thus says the Lord of Ho thus has the Lord of hosts said, dispense true justice and practice kindness or loving kindness and compassion each to his brother and do not oppress the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the poor and do not devise evil in your hearts against one another. There you go. It's fairly simple. There are some things to do and some things not to do that are laid out you know, fairly simply for us, and we want to define uh, what those words mean. But other than that, like it's, it's laid out in a fairly simplistic way. Dispense true justice, uh, practice loving kindness, show compassion, do not oppress people, and it identifies some particularly vulnerable people or situations. And then it says, do not devise evil. So do not oppress, that's external, and then do not devise, meaning don't plan evil in your heart, that's internal. And all of these are things that the individual has to apply, and things that leaders would be responsible to apply, uh, but they're all applied to the level of the individual. And while it even recognizes people who are vulnerable, the orphan, the widow, uh, the resident alien, the um, uh, what's that other one there? The poor. It recognizes these are people that are in a position of vulnerability where they could be taken advantage of or in a position where they are easier to oppress. But it doesn't give them a, uh, a treatment or a prescription from the law that's different or a different set of rules or a different justice, it applies impartial justice and all. So the idea here is dispense true justice, you know, actual justice, justice in reality. And justice, biblical justice, is always tied to, as we said last time, 
tied to the nature and character of God. But I want us to work out a few worldviews that, that influence our thinking uh, today and to think through those things and what, what these ideas have done and, and kind of the compare and contrast what's similar to biblical justice and what's different uh, from biblical justice. And so this is one of the main points. Uh, that's different is that biblical justice is defined by the nature and character of God. Biblical justice is always defined by the nature and character of God. And not a God, not a, a God that probably exists. We're talking about the, the triune God of the Bible, that that is, who has revealed himself to humans, that the uh, Revelation has been received, even if it's rejected, like Romans 1 talks about, even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God. So it's not, not a matter of knowing that the, the revelation has been received and that because we know these things and because God has spoken in his law, uh, he also gives us this ability to understand and evaluate systems of justice. Now... As sinners, we always do it wrongly, but that's why we need God's revelation, we need God's word. But let me read, um, just flip to Romans for a second. Let me read Romans uh, 2, actually instead of Romans 1. Romans 1, great passage to go to, but Romans uh, 2.15, uh, 2, where do I want to start? 2, 14 through 16. It says, For when the Gentiles who do not have the law instinctively do the things of the law, not having the law, they are a law unto themselves, in that they show uh, the work of the law is written on their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or defending them. On the day when God, uh, on the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. So, notice there that God says, "Look, Gentiles, those who don't even have the law, they're still without excuse because they still have the law written on their hearts. And how you know that is not necessarily by the fact that they keep or don't keep the law, or they look like they feel bad. It's that." All people have the, this moral sensibility to judge actions in others. And by having that moral sensibility, we condemn ourselves. It's kind of like, um, have you guys ever had when you were young, or in, you know, I have, uh, when you were young in Sunday school and somebody accused you of praying with, their eyes, with your eyes open? Have you ever had that? Okay. Josh was praying with his eyes open when we were praying. Um, do you, you see the, uh, not logical, but the inconsistent, hypocritical inconsistency there, right? Because if they know I'm praying with my eyes open, uh, that means they had their eyes open too. So by their ability to judge, they condemn themselves. That's what Romans 2 is talking about, that uh, our moral ability to judge when we do uh, instinctively the things of the law, it, we, our minds uh, operate in this kind of schizophrenia with relation to God, where we can evaluate and our thoughts either, they, they alternate between two positions for ourselves and our conscience. We <coughs> accuse ourselves, our conscience, we think about those things and we, we accuse ourselves or we think, or we try to excuse ourselves. We try to make excuses for ourselves and get ourselves out of that. But that, that very ability to do that uh, indicates that we recognize God, we recognize his uh, law on our hearts, on our consciences, and we operate in that world inescapably. And our ability to even speak to those issues demonstrates the, the truth of the God of the Bible. Um, so in doing that, you know, even if people say, well, I don't like the God of the Bible, well, why? What standard of justice or ethics are you evaluating that from? Uh, I mean, because 
what do we care about what sinful man evaluates God who he's rejected? Uh, that doesn't really make a difference. But if they say, well, God, you know, does these bad things. God in the Old Testament kills people. God in the, you know, Jesus in Revelation kills people, all this stuff. You know, they, they make all these moral judgments of God. And I'm like, well, in your worldview, why would that matter? Um, and that's what I want to talk about uh, today is, you know, what, uh, what matters and why. According to, you know, we'll evaluate different worldviews and show why Christianity is true. Biblical uh, Christianity is true because of the impossibility of the contrary. No other worldviews uh, can make sense of these things. And so, you know, we've talked about uh, recently there's a lot of stuff going on about the, the statement uh, black lives matter. There's all lives matter. There's, you know, these things all talking about these things. Uh, now, I bring up in class uh, sometimes when I'm teaching in government, you know, we talk about government and philosophy, and I joke around. I don't know if I'll be able to uh, joke around with this anymore, but my students usually, we have a good relationship and can use some humor. But I, I joke, and I say, well, I take a middle position. I just say, no lives matter. But, uh, and, you know, they laugh and everything. <laughs> and I, I, I try to stick, you know. But <clears throat> if you're consistent in your worldview, why do any lives matter and why? I mean, we can answer those questions biblically. Uh, man knows the answer to the question because he knows the God of the Bible. But if he rejects the God of the Bible, they're going to try to find some other standard. And by those standards, no lives matter. Uh, to whom? What does the word matter even mean? Okay? So these things are, are become meaningless unless you take the biblical worldview. So see, the Christian with a biblical worldview can say that life matter, that human lives matter, that black lives matter, that, that all lives matter, that because they are human lives made in the image of God, that God is the creator God who, who defines us and creates us in his image, that the, the world is based off of his creation and his nature and character, that this is revealed by God to humanity through revelation, that what matters, what justice is and what it is not, is defined by who God is and not by autonomous, independent man. Individuals and groups and nations are going to be judged by their faithfulness to the standard of God's law and God's nature and character, how close or how far they stray from those things. And th therefore, we can say life matters. We can say particular lives matter when they're in a vulnerable situation or they've been mistreated. We can say that uh, humans matter because they are created in the, the image of God and are deserving of dignity and respect. Uh, but what happens if you deny that, the triune God of the Bible, and his law and his nature and character, and what happens when ethics and justice are decided by autonomous man? And autonomous means uh, that you are, uh, the word namas means law. Okay, so autonomous, auto means man. It's, it's a, you know, if you took it literally, uh, it would be man's law. It would be that you're a law unto yourself, that you're autonomous, that you're independent. This is what Adam and Eve uh, wanted. They wanted to uh, be the definers of what good and evil was. And so they wanted to be autonomous. But what happens to ethics and justice when you have independent men and women who have rejected the God of the Bible, who have rejected him as the standard of justice, all deciding for themselves or as groups or as majorities or as governments, all deciding what they think justice means and enforcing that onto other people in the world. I mean, how do you defend that, uh, that worldview? And we'll look at a few different ways. You could say, well, it's, uh, it's pragmatism. It's just by what works. You know, that, that could be one way. It's, but, well, what works for who? Could, does it work for everybody? I mean, every single individual on the planet, does it work for everybody within a, 
nation? Does it work for every single individual or does it work for the majority or just the majority of people who voted or, or, or what? You could decide um, anything on that basis. That, well, a, we, a group of us just decided that, uh, that slavery works for us. You know, it, it works. And because it works for a good amount of us, we decided that it's an ethical and just thing to participate in. You could see how that, you know, could flow into something that's, that's in, unjust and unethical, right? Uh, what happens when autonomous man decides what lives matter, right? Do you really want to have... <clears throat> autonomous man deciding uh, what lives matter and w what lives don't by implication uh, or what matters at all right ultimately you with humanism you have autonomous humanism the worship of, of humanity that will say that it's not religious but they decide on these things and in rejection of God and his law ultimately you have the state the political state decides what matters and who matters. And so you have human power in its highest expression, the political state, that becomes God for those who reject God and worship humanity. And then you have governments deciding what lives matter, what lives don't, what the word matters means, and the government or man becomes the definer of everything. And I mean, <laughs> not that uh, it would matter if this was true, but I mean, would you want to be defined by other people? You know, so other person in power makes a decision and we get defined by them. Uh, but ultimately, with autonomous humanism, what matters is what man decides. And uh, that's, a, that's a pretty bad situation because you think about this, the internal problems of all ethical systems are this. Ethics recognizes, the, the study of ethics recognizes the problems that humans err, meaning we make mistakes, and that we are corrupt, meaning not always, but that we, uh, sometimes our mistakes are on purpose. We do things that are, are wrong, and we recognize that in ourselves and in others. That takes, you know, some humility to, to recognize that you make mistakes. My uncle works uh, for, for UPS, and he was explaining to an employee who tried to kind of do his own system, he goes, no, 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 UPS has worked and honed a system, and the guy said, well, you're expecting me to be perfect, you know, and he had made these mistakes because he tried to do it his own way, and he said, look, everybody's done it. Everybody's thought that they could outsmart the system and do it their own way. Here's the thing, UPS has worked to hone a system that doesn't expect you to be perfect, it expects you to be competent, and then you have a system that self-corrects and catches those mistakes. So that's what ethics is supposed to do. It's supposed to uh, correct those mistakes, uh, those errors. I make mistakes all the time, you know, inputting grades or things like that. Uh, not that it's, you know, uh, excusable, but it's a thing that happens. Uh, on the other hand, we also notice that human beings are, tend to be corrupt, that we can... Uh, commit sin against each other, all those things. Now here's the problem of humanistic ethics. Human ethics means that other corrupt and erring humans have to apply ethical systems to each other. Okay, think about that. Humans are corrupt and make mistakes and now we're going to put them in charge of other humans and say what's right and what's wrong, uh, what matters and what doesn't. And that becomes hugely problematic. Uh, in government, I also talk about uh, James Madison has this famous quote that people really like that says, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Some people think, oh, that's really smart. But what he's saying there is that uh, it is a problem because now you've got men who can't be trusted governing other men. And that's going to be a huge issue. So if you reject you know, God is the standard, anything goes, uh, and, and nothing matters. Um, let me recommend uh, for reading or, or looking up at some point, uh, back in 1802, there was this pastor, Alexander McLeod, and I put it here in my notes, who wrote a, a sermon that said, Negro slavery unjustifiable. 
And he goes through the law, and he talks about Exodus 21, 16, talks about the nature of kidnapping, all this stuff, and talks about uh, why, according to the biblical worldview, chattel slavery, kidnapping and holding someone in permanent bondage, is sinful and should be rejected by God, uh, by God's law, and that Christians should not engage in it. Now, the peop- now according to that, that doesn't mean everybody followed it and, and, and agreed with it and all that stuff. So, but according to that standard, you can see, okay, did people follow God's word or did they not follow God's word? And you can see those examples. Now he says, but his uh, presupposition is are that God is the maker of everything. Only God has all power. God is the one who creates us and and owns us and puts us on this planet for him. And before him, we're all guilty. Uh, before him, we all deserve imprisonment, enslavement. We all deserve his, his judgment. He said, but before men, we are politically innocent. So to capture somebody else who is a uh, human made in the image of God and to kidnap them, Exodus said you got the death penalty for that. Um, there were different types of slavery, of course, but the, this was the uh, idea that you could not uh, trade in human flesh. Well, according to a biblical worldview, that makes sense. Um, but we start stepping off the biblical worldview. We have autonomous man define these things, defining what it means to dispense true justice. And uh, the results are that no lives matter, nothing matters. Let me <clears throat> point out some... Uh, thinkers that you you should be aware of. You don't have to go back and read them, but you should be aware of that their ideas are influencing uh, today. And they're from about 150 years ago, but I'm going to point out four. Uh, Darwin, uh, Freud, Nietzsche, and Marx. Those are four that are influencing today. And uh, I'll even talk about, if I have time, a book uh, that was written, that was the, the Christian church in the 19 teens and 20s, that was called Preaching Eugenics. And it talks about which churches went along with preaching that, uh, or, or adopted modern theory into their system that said that, uh, that basically tried to racially purify uh, societies. Well, it was the churches that were adopting these modern theories who were rejecting the Bible. The, the conservative churches who, not uh, politically conservative necessarily, but the churches that were holding to the truth of God's word, that we're all created in Adam, and that we are all human beings in the image of God, and we take that uh, literally and seriously, those churches were rejecting that stuff. But a lot of churches said, no, 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 this is modern scientific theory. This is important to bring into what we're saying today. They were saying, you know, moving toward, uh, well, you know, if somebody's mentally infirm, you know, to purify the society, we should start uh, making sure that they can't have kids or we should start aborting, you know, those type of practices that happened in the United States uh, during those times because uh, man decided that what mattered. And what, when man does that in rejection of the word of God, uh, you have the opposite of justice taking place. But let me read some different things from Darwin. So let's talk about Darwin for a minute. Um, let me read a quote from his Descent of Man. Okay, so according to Darwin, uh, what does matter mean? What do li- which lives matter? He said, at some future period, not very uh, distant, measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace the savage races throughout the world. So... He was, this was his idea that, okay, the civilized races, the races that are more evolved, are going to start to uh, replace the, uh, the non-civilized races. They'll exterminate them. And this will just be a process of, uh, of evolution. And he says that at the same time, the anthropomorphous apes uh, <clears throat> will no doubt be exterminated. Uh, the break between man and his nearest allies will be wider for it will intervene between man in a more civilized state, as we hope, (coughs) even the Caucasian, and some ape, as low as a baboon, instead of, as now, the Negro, or the Australian and the gorilla. 
So he's saying, okay, well, the Caucasian's a little more up here around this, a little further evolved than the Negro or the Australian, right? So uh, you start to look at these things. This is uh, a term that's actually a contradiction. It's scientific racism, where you start to use these scientific theories to start to say, okay, which groups of society don't matter and can we uh, try to eliminate, even if you try to eliminate it in a uh, softer way, you know, like, okay, well, let's just make sure that the next generation doesn't have uh, kids by these, you know, these policies. We'll make sure they have less kids and these groups have more. Uh, but the, the goal there was to, Darwin saw, and he wasn't saying, okay, go out and do this, okay, to be clear and fair to, uh, to him, but he was saying that this was just a process of evolution, that it's not a that it's not like, okay, these certain lives matter and these lives don't. It's just a process of evolution. It's just we survive to this point and whatever survives, it doesn't matter. It's just literally matter in motion. You're just stardust. And so according to Darwin's naturalism and the, the implications that others have taken that and followed through and built their own theories from that, no lives matter. You know, naturalism, life, uh, life matters in the sense that it keeps surviving, but that's it. It's just about survival, you know, survival of the fittest. Now, that can be true in different things. We see that with animals or, you know, that type of thing that they, uh, they adapt, they change over time. Uh, but that, you know, definition is then taken to mean, okay, well, it also adopt all this other stuff that uh, is actually anti-science. Uh, but naturalism is the philosophy there. Naturalism is that uh, everything is just natural processes, just a matter of nature, and therefore, you know, it, this is the result. It's just about evolutionary survival. The problem with naturalism is that if naturalism is true, and you'll have a lot of people presupposing naturalism and arguing it to you, and if you, if you have naturalism, the problem with it is that if the person is arguing it, well, what does that mean if they take their worldview seriously? Everything is just a matter of natural processes, meaning that they are themselves and that we are all just physical and chemical processes. Like I'm standing up here and I'm talking and we're having a conversation and you're thinking about things and I'm thinking about things. But our being here, we're just like, uh, you know, stuff in a laboratory. It, it, it makes no difference. It, it's just like a, the rocks are sitting outside and, and we're in this room. It, it really is not a uh, difference of kind or nature. It's just we're happening to be doing this. And I, the reason why I'm talking or reading or doing these things is just chemical processes in my brain and body are making it happen, okay? But think about that if the naturalist holds their view consistently, they'll often tell you, you should adopt their worldview. You should be a naturalist too. That's all it is. You know, you have uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson doing these you know videos of these things or he's like a... a, a not a scientist, he's just on these scientific videos for some reason, but he's like, you know, we're stardust, you know, you should be amazed by that, um, that we're, we're stardust. Um, and then they scoff at the Bible, it says man's made from the dust of the earth, right? Um, but, okay, well, their view is scientific. Well, if naturalism is true, the person who's arguing for it is only arguing that way because their mind is sending off physical and chemical uh, receptors to argue that way. They don't have any choice. They don't have any freedom. They don't have any self-awareness to evaluate different theories, look at the evidence, and choose from right and wrong or true and false. Their view is just a matter of their brain and their chemical processes. And mine is too, if naturalism is the case. Now, if the naturalist tells me, the Christian, who believes biblical presuppositions and rejects those presuppositions, tells me as the Christian, hey, you should be a naturalist. I say, wait a second. 
you're telling me all that there is is natural and chemical processes leading to these results and that because of those things that means your brain reacts one way and that means my brain reacts another way. My brain is making physical and chemical processes that make me believe Christianity and make me a Christian. You can't tell me that I'm right or wrong. There is no right and wrong. I'm just fizzing. I'm not thinking, feeling, doing anything. I'm just chemically reacting just like you are. So there's no debate. It's just, we're just a, a Coke and a Pepsi. And we're just fizzing, we're not thinking. And we're not arguing. So you can't say my position's wrong, you can't say your position's right, and there's no possibility for argument there. But you see, by, that, by even acknowledging naturalism or saying that that's their worldview, nobody can do that consistently. Okay, they're not, we don't operate that way. We're, we're thinking creatures, and our, we have a brain, it's a physical part of us, so we have a body, don't get me wrong, like those physical and chemical processes are involved, but that's because uh, God created us. Um, and we have that, that awareness, we have that consciousness, we uh, can have that discussion. But uh, if that's the truth, then why would a naturalist try to promote naturalism or tell me I should believe in it? There is no such thing as should in a naturalist worldview. Um, so if naturalism is true, there's no reason to believe that naturalism is true because that means we're just Coke and Pepsi, uh, you know, doing physical and chemical processes. Uh, and I could say, okay, well, you, you know, you should choose things that cause you to survive. Well, even that would be meaningless as well. So another, another worldview, uh, or another worldview thinker that, that contributes their theory of autonomous man that builds off of Darwin's naturalism and materialism is Marx. So we've got Karl Marx, the uh, communist uh, manifesto, the, the real influencer on uh, thinking from his time in the 1860s uh, and 70s, maybe uh, got the date wrong, I think maybe he's not born into the 60s or in his writing yet in that point. Um, but anyway, he is writing uh, and his idea is that of materialism, that it's just material, that there are no thoughts and actions. That you're going back and forth in this struggle. And his idea was that the economic haves, the people who uh, maybe own a factory that other people work in, and the have-nots, the factory worker who works there, that there needs to be a, a switch of those things a, a temporary overthrow of that whole system and that the have-nots need to take over internationally, have a short dictatorship, and then after that you'd enter into a stateless utopia where you wouldn't uh, need to operate that way anymore. And that was his idea. But in order to do that, you had to get rid of all the structures of uh, society and his idea was for class warfare, was for different groups to uh, fight each other in order to finally take over uh, in a revolution, hand ultimate power over to the state, and then enter a, a situation of a stateless utopia. Uh, but in Marx's worldview, if it's just material, well then there's no difference. There's no, it doesn't, nothing matters in his worldview either because it's just material trying to get power over other material. It's just class warfare, these different groups trying to compete and struggle and fight against each other, which can be true. And uh, that, you know, there's oppression, those different things that take place. But his goal is if you're being, you're in the situation of the oppressed, uh, you should overthrow the system and then create a, a new system and be in charge of this even greater system of the state and then therefore there will be no more oppression. But what ends up happening is you start lodging power into more human authority that rejects God and you get a system that oppresses everybody. And Marx's uh, system obviously uh, collapsed, you know, communism in nations where it's tried collapsed at a huge price of, uh, you know, 150 million deaths during the, uh, 
during the last century, you know, way more than oppressive systems of all other history could have uh, accomplished because they didn't have the power to, to do those things uh, back then. And so he accomplishes this, you know, these, these things, but it, it never, it kind of fails, these places where it's tried. So instead of economically, now the class warfare is between races, between genders, between uh, sexual orientations, between all sorts of different things that they can divide people up on. And the idea is fight each other, and then these different groups find their solution in the human powers of the state. But my question is always, well, if oppression is the problem, do you really feel like your situation will be better in regard to oppression in handing over power to the political state? And so, you know, it's gonna, I, I don't see it ever going that way in history. But materialism, if material is all that there is, again, no lives matter. Uh, Nietzsche, he said, life is truth and truth is life. Basically, whatever survives is what matters. He says, he's famous for God is dead and, and we killed him. And he believed that there is no possibility of objective truth. He said it was just language could not be fully meaningful and that there meant he believed that there was no possibility of objective truth and knowledge. And that's something that's come out today, is influenced an idea that's uh, come out a little bit further called postmodernism, which means that there's an infinite interpretation, uh, amount of interpretations of the world, and that no interpretation is better than any other one. And it's been thought up by some very smart people, but they're wrong because it's an ultimate interpretation about saying no interpretation is correct. Nietzsche is, he came up with uh, what's called perspectivism. Everything is just based on perspective. There's no knowledge, there's no truth, there's only willpower. And life is totally meaningless and the person who's the best is the person who can rise above that, recognize that life is meaningless, embrace life as meaningless, not care about anything, and live that way according to willpower, and just do it. And, uh, and that's simplifying Nietzsche, but, his, but even his willpower is meaningless. And by saying that there's no possibility of objective truth, but take my system, because it's true and you should believe it, is a self-defeating position. And then you've got uh, Freud, right? Where there, you've got the denial, you've got psychology now, that is the denial, that based off these previous theories, the denial of the soul. You know psychology comes from the word, it's literally Latin for the study of the soul. It's the knowledge of the soul, uh, suke in, in Greek, uh, I guess not Latin, but in Greek is the, uh, the soul. And so that word psyche or uh, psychology is supposed to be soul study. Well, modern psychology is all based off of the denial of the soul. Uh, and it transitioned everything to sickness. Man is just, man who does not follow in these worldviews or adopt these, these formulas of thinking, they're simply sick. There's no sin, there's only sickness. Right? And that's, if you think that hasn't bled into today, uh, just look around on uh, social media. Right? Every, uh, all kinds of sin is described as simply people are sick. And it's the same people who want to say that they, they don't have any control over all these situations will also usually argue for you that I have free will in relation to God. Well, it's like, well, wait a second, you know. You could have free will in the sense that uh, if you adopt a biblical worldview and God gives us human responsibility, but otherwise you're, you're in a situation where you're stuck if you adopt naturalism, materialism, the denial of the soul, and you know, those, those type of worldviews because uh, you're just a, a reaction. You're not choosing something that's... Uh, that's good or bad or true or false. But let me read some things about what, uh, some quotes from Freud about his view of what he believed psychology was taking over. Uh, he says, the words secular pastoral worker might well serve as a general formula for describing the function uh, of the analysis. 
uh, of the analyst. So he's saying basically, instead of doing soul care like a pastor might do, he's saying the, his version of psychology is to basically take that over in the secular field, in the God-rejecting field with God-rejecting uh, presuppositions. And so basically to do soul care when he doesn't believe in the uh, possession of a soul. Uh, Carl Jung, another um, writer of this time, talked about man, just the situation of man. He's asked a rhetorical question. He talks about, you know, this sad situation of man. He says, basically, where does man go from his having no love, but only sexuality, no faith, but he is afraid to grope in the dark, no hope, because he is disillusioned by the world, by life, and no understanding because he has failed to read the meaning of his own existence. Everything is meaningless, and it's time to accept that and feel better about it. That's what a lot of modern psychology, and th this is not modern, this is old, but uh, is about. But you see, if you adopt those, uh, those worldviews, uh, you end up with a self-defeating worldview that rejects God that oppresses man and that cannot account for ethics and justice. And so let me just finish up by reading again. What, well, what's our responsibility as, as Christians? Uh, what are we to participate in? Uh, knowing God's word uh, and having that as our final authority. Well, let me read again, Zechariah 7, 8 through 10. It says, then the word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, Thus has the Lord of hosts said, Dispense true justice, meaning participate in justice that is in line with God's nature and character, and practice loving kindness, show God's grace, meaning show God's unique uh, love and favor to those who cannot repay it, and compassion to each one his brother. And do not oppress which biblical oppression is to press upon, to violate, to, to defraud, to steal something by tricking someone, to get something deceitfully, to do something wrong, to extort someone, uh, not to exist in some sort of uh, hierarchy. It's to do a positive action that harms someone in a way that is contrary to God's word. Um, and then... There are some people to look out for. And these aren't necessarily the only ones, but this is a good start. And do not oppress the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the resident alien, the, or the poor. Meaning, don't oppress those people. Try to seek justice for them, according to God's word. And, then it gets back to the heart. Do not devise evil in your heart. Do not plan evil against other people. Now, the problem was, in Zechariah's time and before, God says, well, remember the fathers? Remember the previous generation? Uh, their whole issue was that they quit listening. They turned to God a stubborn shoulder. They made their heart like flint, meaning they couldn't, you couldn't scratch it like a diamond. It's, it's, it, you can scratch something on it, but it will not be scratched, it, meaning it won't make a difference. They, they, turned, they made their ears tired of hearing God, and they didn't obey God. And God says, they didn't listen to the former prophets. He says, don't be like them, and warns them not to do that. He says, because if you do, the same judgment can come onto you. The same discipline uh, can come onto you. But uh, let's uh, close in a word of prayer, and then go to worship. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the understanding of, uh, that it brings just in making sense of the world around us. Lord, we pray that you would give us even more clarity of thought, but not just for ourselves, not just that we'd be intellectually satisfied or that we would uh, feel better about having uh, a worldview that is, is consistent with you, Lord, but that we do these things in, honor to, uh, in order to honor you and to make you uh, Lord of our lives and to f try to be more uh, consistent in obeying you, Lord. So we pray that you would uh, cause us to walk in faithfulness in these things, to dispense true justice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.